So this is lecture 23 of ECE 2305. And so in today's lecture, we're going to be looking at reliable data transfer, RDT. Okay? We're actually going to look at several versions of RDT. And, and um, what we're going to look at in particular are all five versions and their variants. Okay? So we're going to look at RDT versions 1, 2, 2.1, 2.2, and 3. What they do is that each subsequent version uh, deals with a particular issue with the previous version of RDT. All right? So what is the concept behind reliable data transfer? So in general, what happens is if you look at packetized data, so we're looking at packetized data. We can look at so many other issues at the physical layer, but let's look at the basic unit of information that we've reached in this class, right? So in fact, if you think about it, okay, so this was actually kind of an epiphany moment this morning when I was creating the slides and studying and preparing for today's lecture. It was actually kind of interesting. We've transcended a lot of layers from the real physical layer, the electromagnetic propagation of radio waves, right? In both wired and wireless environments, we looked at a little bit about policy and about regulation of how channels are allocated to different applications. We looked at different ways of encoding that information in those electromagnetic waves. And then we progressively moved all the way up, up what, uh, you know, those layers, right? So the network access layer, and, and what, we've, what we're now at is essentially, okay, now we have everything looking like packets, right? We're looking at everything in terms of IP addresses and IP packets and information. So we're actually, we've already abstractified, if that's a real word, but we've abstracted, that's a real word, um, essentially everything below us into the basic unit of information. No, trust me, like I've seen some made up words, like that's the thing, never leave engineers in charge of creating the English language because I think the latest made up word I've heard was cloudification. So you hear of the cloud? Well, let's cloudify, you know, I'm like, doesn't make sense. Anyways, so what happens is we've reached now a point in the communication system where the basic unit of information is no longer the electron, where we were with electromagnetic waves, it's no longer the bit where we did basic digital comms, it's no longer, um, what did we deal with? MAC addresses, so the MAC layer and frames. We're now at the IP layer, right? And so the basic unit of information is the packet, right? The IP packet. And what's kind of interesting is that each community, each uh, communications community um, looks at essentially what is their fundamental unit of information. So for me, actually, it's the bit. That's my fundamental unit of information. If you look at anybody that designs antennas and such, it's the electrons and the like. But for at this layer, we're actually looking at someone a little bit higher up the, the stack than me. And so what they're concerned about is what happens if that basic unit of information, the packet, gets corrupted, right? What happens if that packet is lost? What happens if that packet comes in out of order? So. I'm going to draw this. I really miss drawing. I was like thinking ever since Friday afternoon when class went out. It's like, oh, I really miss my Wacom tablet. I really want to draw. I really want to draw. So what happens is we have, let's say, a transmitter, right? And let's say this is a channel, OK? Channel. And here's my receiver. No, this is not a prescription. So what happens is, say, I send these packets. So packet one, two, three, four. And they're all going from transmitter to receiver. I'm making no assumption whether it's a wired or wireless environment. And so many things can happen, right? So there is packet corruption. <laughs> and suddenly I had this image of like, you know, someone in a trench coat going, psst. You know, <laughs> you know, no, no, that, that's so, that, that's a bad joke. It's like, here's, here's 50 grand. Don't, don't get to the receiver. No, no, just kidding. So no, what, <laughs> sorry, bad, bad. But what happens is, what, what, what corrupts a packet? It gets hit with an error so tremendous. Like, let's say, for instance, at that moment, there's suddenly a, a very uh, large amount of noise or some sort of impairment in the channel. 
right? So let's say, for instance, this channel can have lots of noise. And the noise can be a variety of things, including my favorite, impulse noise, right? Which would fit perfectly. What happens is, suppose as this guy, so let's say we zoom in. As these, these packets are going through the channel as a function of time, right? What happens is, suppose all of a sudden lightning strikes or some sort of impairment occurs, bless you, some electromagnetic impairment comes and zings that packet. It's no longer readable. So maybe the header is received, but then maybe everything inside that packet is gobbledygook, right? So that's one. You can also have okay, packet loss. And that may happen as well. What happens is, suppose all these packets, remember, um, this is kind of like a connection-like scenario, right? Where we have a dedicated path from transmitter to receiver. The internet, does it work like that? No. Networks of networks, lots of routers, data gets, packets might not go in sequence with each other down the exact same path. They'll go in best effort from end to end, whichever path might get them there, right? And the problem is, some of those packets might end up in a dead end, right? And then finally, my favorite, packet reordering. And so what does that mean? So again, so actually, let me redraw that. So the packet loss and the packet reordering. So let's say we now go to our transmitter, we have our receiver, and then we have lots of routers, right? And so let's say our transmitter connects with that guy, and our receiver has connectivity there. And so the information might go down that path, but a few packets might end up going this way, maybe to connect there. Oh, now he took a big turn over there. It's like my driving. And then what happens is ultimately gets to the receiver. But what happens, packets one and four took the shortest path. Packets two and three, unfortunately, took the scenic route and they're out of order with packets one and four. So it's almost like, for instance, whenever my parents-in-law, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, and my wife and I, we go from our house in West Boylston to my parents-in-law house in Sterling, and we each take our fastest route and we just like gun it, right? It's like, who gets there first, right? So let's say, first my parents-in-law pull out of my driveway, then my brother-in-law, sister-in-law, because I want to give them a head start. And then here I am. And so here I am. I'm going down 190. And I'm like, oh, no, no stadies? OK. And then let's say my father-in-law and mother-in-law, because I think my, you know, they go down Route 12. And again, no town, no town cops? And, you know, and then my brother-in-law, like, you know, look out for that black Mercedes. It's just like, whichever way he goes, he'll go over trees and stuff. And what happens is, for some reason, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law get there first, I get there second, and then my father-in-law and mother-in-law get there third. And then they say, what speed were you going? Oh, let's not talk about speed, you know? But that's a case of packet reordering. The information gets there because we took different paths. Um, I'm not sure there's speed limits on the internet. Maybe. But uh, for the most part, um, let's say we all go the same amount of time. In this case, the information for the internet, it's partly path length and also the congestion of the router and, and such that will dictate how long your information will stay. And so as a result, um, information that goes down several routes will actually come out not in the same order that you transmit it as. All right. So why am I going on and on and on talking about it? Because we need to come up with a crafty way of saying, what happens if there is an error or there's something that we need to sort of call on, right? Suppose we need to retransmit. Or in my father-in-law and mother-in-law's case, let's say a redo. So what happens is there's these protocols that we can follow in order to correct for any issues in unreliable data transmission. So the first one's RDT1. And RDT1 assumes perfect channel, right? The channel's perfectly reliable. Um, there's no noise. There's no bit errors. There's no loss of packets. It is pristine, right? And uh, what happens is, so I'm not sure how many people here have heard of the term finite state machine. 
Good, good. Most of you, and those who have not, just ask the friend next to you because they do. So what happens is finite state machines, what happens is it basically dictates, this is what I love about receivers and transmitters, they're basically driven by logic. All their, for the most part, almost all our modern wireless and wired communications equipment have an FSM. They follow specific logic. I'm now in an idle position. Oh, I'm receiving data? Okay, what type of data? Who's it from? And what sort of actions I need to perform based on what is coming in? Okay, I didn't get that information correctly. What do I do now? Oh, I need to send information back to the original transmitter and say, I didn't receive all that. What actions should I perform? Should you retransmit? Should I just say, information lost, don't worry about it, right? So, what sort, so the state machine provides sort of this um, mechanism for dictating all the actions of the transmitter and the receiver, right? And we all know what the sender and receiver do, right? Send data into the channel and pick information from the channel. It could be wired or wireless. So that's RDT1. RDT1 essentially is, it's all, it, it's, everything's perfect, everyone's happy. Oh, now I'm thinking of the Lego movie, right? Like, I, I, yeah, I, I just have a blur of that from when I was flying over the Pacific last year. So, everybody happy. Yeah, okay. So, so RDT 2.0 does not make those idealistic assumptions. So, RDT 2.0 says there is bit errors. Bit errors is what corrupts information, right? To me, I love bit errors. Well, I don't love bit errors, but I'm, I know what bit errors are. Because for me, the bit is the fi a fundamental unit of information. For a packet, packets ultimately consist of bits. And so what do we do in order to detect the bit error? We use the checksum. Like, OK, here's a bunch of data in the packet. Bah, 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 bah. OK, what does the checksum say? <gasps> hmm, something's not adding up. <laughs> bit error. Somewhere's a bit error, right? There's a bug, right? Especially if it's very, very very uh, paranoid uh, receiver. Oh, there's an error. And so what do you do if you have an error? You can do ACK, right? You're going to see a lot of this in today's lecture, ACK. Let's, let's ACK that, right? That's been ACKED. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what happens is you acknowledge receipt of information. So what happens is, did you get, did you get this information over? Yes, over. It's almost like that Family Guy episode, right? How do you end over? Like, let's say, did you receive that over? Over, you know? So, um, so ACK is basically, did you, did you receive that message? If I don't hear the ACK, something's wrong, right? Nobody's at the other end. It's almost like you're talking, I'm not sure how many of you have experienced this, but on Skype, and you just hear nothing. And it's like, hello? Is anyone there? And then it's like, oh, yeah, 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 I, I heard. I was just like on mute or something like that. Oh, okay, okay, no problem. Next on the other hand, are the negative. It's like, did you get all of that? Uh-uh. And I just say, knack, knack that, okay? Then what happens is, if I get a knack, I retransmit. It's easy, right? It can also be very irritating. Like, you know, I, I do this all the time. <clears throat> um, you know, it's like, hey, Alex, are you going to get milk when, when you're out at Walmart and stuff? What? Are you going to get milk when you're at Walmart? What? You know, and I just do that a few times just to, to, to irritate. And then, of course, I'm in trouble, and the rest of the evening is just bad. So, uh, so knack when you mean it, OK? So what happens is uh, there is this beautiful thing called ARQ. You probably have heard of it, OK? Automatic repeat request. What happens is, so there's error detection. So you know that there are issues in your data. If there's an issue, right? So ACK means, yes, send me the next one. NAC, please retransmit. Okay? And so essentially what automatic repeat request does is um, you get the data, and if it's corrupted, you ask for it again. Simple, right? It's corrupted. Get me another one. So the problem is that the sender does not know what's happening at the receiver, right? And so what happens is, so what happens if our ACK and NAC is corrupted? Oh, that's true. So this sometimes happens when we put the control information in the exact same channel as the data. And there's something called, what is it called? 
bi uh, yeah, bidirectional. So the channel is bidirectional. So if there's a lot of noise and turbulence and disruption, uh, basically the corruption that's affecting the, the data on this way, how do you know that your ACK and NAC are being successfully received on the way back? Legit, right? So there's a problem. So what happens is, did you get that? And all you hear back is, you didn't get that. You know, and then it's like, oh, he got it. I'm going to send the next one. That's a problem. Okay? So that's where RDT 2.1 kicks in. What happens is, um, like, what you do is you, the sender retransmits the current packet if the ACK NAC is corrupted, okay? And then the sender adds a sequence number. Oh. So now we embed a little bit more information. Because what we're doing now is, like, suppose we send an ACK or NAC, okay, and it gets corrupted. What we do is we retransmit the information. We add the sequence number that tells us, okay, so we're, we're, we're having this information. It's coming in this order. But wait, 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 wait. I, I, like, there's, there's a problem here. Did you hear my ACK or NAC the first time? So this sequence number um, kind of tries to avoid this idea of, like, the duplicate packets being sent. All right? So what, because what will happen is, let's say I, I don't hear an ACK. Oh, I don't think it got it. I'm going to retransmit. But he did get that. So what's going on? Oh, I just sent a duplicate anyway. OK, 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 I got that. Don't worry about it. OK. So what happens is when we deal with the, wow, typos everywhere. So the ACK and NAC errors, what happens is the sender, we, we put the sequence number to the packet. There are two, OK? So we have 0 and a 1. So what happens is here's the original. Oh, and here's the retransmitted. That's the 1. OK? That's all we really care about. And at the receiver, OK, oh, sorry, at the sender, so we check to see if, any, if we have any corrupted ACK-NACs. And the sender needs to remember whether the expected packet sequence number is a 0 or 1. So you have to have a little bit of memory at the sender in order to keep track of that sequence number. At the receiver, we just have to make sure, is there a duplicate? And then at the same time, how, like, you know, with respect to the ACK-NACs, have they been received correctly at the uh, sender, OK? So the ACK, if it's the same packet, the sequence number received once, and NAC otherwise. So what happens is, we, w what we do is we do this retransmit. And if we ACK it, it means, yeah, we already got the first one. Don't worry about it. We NAC it otherwise. means that, no, 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 I, I didn't, that I didn't get. So OK, good. I got that sorted out. Now the NAC free. Sugar-free, now NAC-free. You know, it's like, so here's your RDT protocol that's NAC-free. I heard it's only half the calories. So what happens is it's almost the same as RDT 2.1, but it only uses ACKs. Okay? Very positive uh, protocol, really positive. So what happens is you just send ACKs for the last packet received, and you know, the receiver needs to explicitly include a sequence number for the packs being, packets being ACKed. And then duplicate acts at the sender results in the same as a NAC. So, so it's almost like a double positive. All right? Now, finally, RDT 3.0. The best. No, just kidding. So what happens is this guy is very specific. So the, the previous one, so RDT 1, meh, RDT 2.0, 2.1, and 2.2 just deal with errors. I have a, I have a packet. Zing, you know, bazinga. Basically, the, the packet uh, is corrupted, right? Um, and there are bit error rates. This deals with delay. This deals with drop, drop packets entirely. So whereas the other two only deal with error, these, this guy here deals also with loss and delay. Bless you. So what happens is here, in a, the underlying channel, so we, we can lose packets and, and such. So we have checksums, we have uh, sequence numbers, acts, retransmissions. But instead, on top of that, we add one little more bit of information, just to make everyone you know, a little bit more like nervous. And that is timers and timeout. So what happens is you probably have seen this already. Where? Oh, yes, ping, right? It's like what happens is you send a request, right? Or you use trace route. It's like, how long am I here? How, like, yes? It kept doing that when I did like, the trace route 
You yes. Put it in my jigger, get like request timeout and you like time. Really? Yeah. Wait, wait, in Linux? No, just the one that I shipped to your gear. Like I was doing uh breakthroughs. Have you tried off campus? <coughs> I tried my own laptop. At home? Yeah. Do you have Windows 8 by any chance? Is that the same thing? It worked on Windows 10. What? It worked on Windows 10. It did? OK. <sighs> when you have 86 people with 86 laptops and different computers, you get about 200 different <laughs> variants. We have, to, we have to check that out. Oh my god. <sighs> when it does work, <laughs> you should have some information like this. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work very well here. So what happens is you should have something like, like request times out, right? And, and the timer. And what that does is essentially, like, you know, when, when you send or that you receive that information, like, how long is that information good for? And it makes sense, because after a while, your, your application is going to process with or without that information after a certain bit. So you have to have some sort of expiration date. And so that's what the timer and timeout is all about. And so for per the performance, unfortunately, is not so great. Because um, what this little example here does, like for one gigabit link, gigabit per second link and 15 millisecond propagation time and 8,000 bit packets, what this guy tells us okay, is it doesn't do great. Because if you notice, first of all, the round trip time, and this you've probably seen with, um, with uh, either, um, no, with ping. Uh, what you'll see is like, okay, 30 milliseconds. Eh, so we're talking about going to Canada, right? Hey, you know, maybe you guys are physically not going to Canada, but you can always send your information to Toronto or something. Anybody here a Leafs fan? Leafs fan? Good, good, okay, good. <laughs> Me neither. So, and this is being recorded, so, so anyways. <laughs> so what happens is 30 milliseconds, but then the transmission delay. What, bless you. So what ends up happening is the transmission delay is 8 microseconds. So when we look at sender utilization, we have this really small number. But if we look at the round trip time and one kilobyte packet every 30 milliseconds, what we get is we get 33 kilobits, uh, kilobytes per second thr uh, throughput over that one gigabit per second link. OK, so that, that is lecture 23. Yay!